Browns in the fabric of Cleveland. Those people for so many years have loved that team. It's the cradle of football, the stadium, the weather. The Browns experience is the essence of pro football in America. Deep roots, loyal fans, and now a team leaving town. This all started because Art Modell lied to the people of Cleveland about his true intentions. No team, no peace! No team, no peace! Have we lost money? Millions. The Browns' red ink is writing the latest but hardly the last chapter in the developing drama of musical franchises. Commissioner Tagliabue, uh, he doesn't control the league. He doesn't control the destiny of the league. And fans wonder what their years of support are worth. If the Browns are moving, is any team safe? Fan loyalty, maximum profits, and civic pride, all entering a new era, and not very gently. Our topic on Outside the Lines, Brownout in Cleveland. Good evening from a city in mourning. This is Cleveland Municipal Stadium, and in 40 hours, the Cleveland Browns will play what may very well be their final game here. The impending move of the Cleveland Browns to Baltimore has tapped a national vein of reaction. There is anger, there is incredulity, and there is resignation. Here in Cleveland, this Friday was dedicated to the continuing effort of saving the Browns, virtually now a holy crusade here in northern Ohio, even as that 4-10 Browns team prepares for their living wake here on Sunday. Here's Andrea Kramer. It appeared to be a typical Friday practice at the Browns facility in suburban Cleveland. But less than 48 hours before they are to play what is expected to be the final game in Cleveland Municipal Stadium, there are mixed feelings in the locker room. Some players just want to get this over with, while several veterans who have long personal and professional ties to the city are emotional and sentimental, especially for the fans. Uh, I had a, a feeling of sadness um, that came over me, uh, a feeling of, uh, you know, retrospect. Once you walk out of that locker room and you come out through the dugout and you're going to come with them steps and you see 80,000 people screaming and hollering and you start to feel that emotion that they're bringing toward the game. And as you walk up the steps to come on the field, you look straight ahead and you see the dog pound. And you see them barking, and they're they, they howling, they're yelling, and they haven't got their clothes off. It's hard to uh, express the feeling that you get. You get such a rush and so pumped up that you want to stay in that kind of mode year-round. And that, I, I would definitely remember that. i never forget the way that makes me feel. And I actually have seen people cry uh, with the, you know, with the the looming possibility of a team moving. And what do they say to you? You know, we're going to miss you. We love you. Uh, don't go. Uh, you know, so it's... And that's tough. You know, when you see somebody, uh, an adult, that is uh, emotional about this situation, it, it's tough. Meanwhile, in downtown Cleveland, representatives from 11 cities, including the mayors of Cleveland, Houston, Chicago, Seattle, and Tampa, cities all embroiled in stadium and relocation issues, met to discuss strategies to combat the growing epidemic of franchise free agency. Also in attendance was Neil Austrian, the president of the NFL. We're disappointed that the process got to this point. Uh, with, without being able to try and really understand the issues on both sides. What I encourage the mayors to do is to really let themselves be known to myself, the commissioner, and our staff in New York, such that we try and solve the problem long before it gets to a point where people have chosen sides and, and nobody wants to talk with the other. When asked if Cleveland's move was a done deal, Austrian told ESPN, no, in his mind, it was far from being over. And Cleveland Mayor Mike White emphatically concurred. The Cleveland Browns aren't playing their last game um, in 48 hours. Uh, they're going to play their last game in Atlanta on January 17th. Uh, unfortunately, the players are going to be on the sidelines, but the people of this town are going to be on the field. 
and I want you to know that we're going to play it like it's a Super Bowl, and we intend to win. The Browns' last on-the-field victory was seven weeks ago against the Bengals, and they hope what could be their final game here will be remembered as a win, not to mention their own pride and job security is at stake. Players plan to commemorate the day in a variety of ways. Some want to shake hands with as many fans as possible. Others will bring video cameras to capture the historic day. They hope the fans will be supportive, not stubborn. But a local radio station is sponsoring one final, futile, vicarious act. Bob, on Sunday in the stadium parking lot, they will hang Art Modell in effigy. Thanks, Andrea. A little bit later, we'll take a look at what kind of a man Art Modell is. And we should note at the top of our program, we did extend an invitation to Art Modell to participate in this edition of Outside the Lines. But because of pending litigation, he declined, as did all members of the Browns organization. There are 10 lawsuits currently pending against the Browns. Here at Municipal Stadium, game day workers, the ticket takers, the ushers and the like, were all given 50% raises once the Browns announced their intention to move. The reason being, the first game after the announcement, the no-shows among those employees way up. The Browns gave those raises to make sure their workers would show up. There is not much holiday joy in this city right now. I appear before you with a very, very heavy heart, a profound sense of uh, remorse, almost despondency. If they go, <laughs> it'll be over our dead bodies. Save our Browns! Save our Browns! We've given Art Modell everything that he's got, and this is what he does to us. No team, no peace! No team, no peace! No team, no peace! No team, no peace! When he comes into town to see his lawyers or something, he sneaks into town. None of us know that he's here, and he, he goes out again. Northern Ohio is raging with twin turbines of emotion. Wistful love for the cornerstone of 50 chilly seasons by the lake. And anger for the one-time leading citizen of Cleveland, the man who would take their team away. Emotion poisoning the spirit of the season. This all started because Art Modell lied to the people of Cleveland about his true intentions. Well, Cleveland Mayor Michael White says you're attempting to rewrite history here today. I'm attempting to rewrite history? Let, let him prove that. A tidal wave of reaction and anger forcing Art Modell into seclusion behind a wall of security. Have there been death threats directed to Brown's personnel? To me and to others. Cleveland is losing its team because after half of Art Modell's life as Brown's owner, he says he's losing his shirt. Have we lost money? Millions. Millions. There is no way in God's name, given the fan loyalty in Cleveland, that anyone can lose $60 million in a football team in this town. Maybe in Tampa, maybe in Houston, but not in Cleveland. Not with the number one Nielsen ratings, not with 70,000 people in the stand. Uh, it's a pretty hard thing to do. You'd have to really work hard to do that. Art Modell says he's lost $21 million in the last two years operating the Browns. Do you have any idea if that's accurate? Well, the only thing I will say is that uh, the question, do the Browns have major debt in place, the answer is yes. And have they been losing money? Yes. Grease is Modell's adversary, but he says the loss is actual and not an accounting trick. Modell claims to personally owe $10 million with the Browns close to the NFL debt limit of $50 million. Still, most Clevelanders and leading economists elsewhere doubt the Browns are that bad off. Not if they're playing to near-capacity crowds with their base player payroll covered by their TV income as the club makes $6 million a year in stadium revenue, the fifth largest total in the National Football League. The Browns may be losing money, but Art Modell has several pockets. Currently, the Browns receive only the ticket price. They do not receive the price of the loges. Where does that go? Stadium Corporation. Which is 50% owned by Art Modell and 50% owned by Al Lerner. That's my understanding. Modell is his own landlord, the co-owner of the Cleveland Stadium Corporation. He says that pocket is empty too. From years of maintaining a crumbling 64-year-old stadium for the Browns and, until recently, the Cleveland Indians. 1974 to the present, I have spent, on behalf of the city of Cleveland, $66 million to keep the stadium 
to sustain the stadium, to keep the Indians, keep the Browns. Modell negotiated his Baltimore move. During a moratorium in Cleveland, he requested on talks about his stadium. His credibility in his adopted hometown is rock very, bottom. Very tough road. Bob Greaves had believed Modell's 1994 pledge he'd never moved the team from Cleveland until a Browns board meeting October 20th. I had called and asked if there was any special item on the agenda. I was told no, it was a routine meeting. And I walked in there with no inkling whatsoever uh, that there was any relocation planned at that time. Did you get the feeling you might have been the only one in the room who was finding out then and there? I'm sure I was the only one in the room that was finding out <laughs> that time. Now the world knows, and the city of Cleveland is moving heaven and earth to stop the move. No team, no peace! No team, no peace! Did you state your name for the record, please? Arthur B. Modell. The city won an early victory in court before a county judge up for re-election next year. The Browns now cannot move until a trial is held over breaking their stadium lease three years early. Modell is the stadium landlord. Essentially, he gave himself permission to leave. I think when we learned uh, right after the election what had been done, uh, the kind of one piece of paper, the same person dealing on both sides, that was one issue that clearly concerned us, and that's one of the things and one of the reasons we went to court. They've also gone to Washington. Save our Browns! Save our Browns! If you take a look at the number of camera banks outside, they outrank Whitewater and Bosnia and uh, the CIA. National attention, a sports topic, and an issue with just one popular side created a congressional media event. I'm glad to hear we have 800 loyal members of, the, of them dogs in the dog pound in South Carolina also. The Mr. North and the South have gotten together. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have a signed contract in hand. The Browns' move to Baltimore is an NFL public relations nightmare. The league would love a limited shield from antitrust laws to better regulate franchise ships. It's crucial that either the courts get their heads screwed on right or that Congress uh, get the antitrust laws straightened out. What it boils down to, with all due respect to my good friend Commissioner Tagliabue uh, on the front row behind me here, he doesn't control the league. Glenn's proposed bill would give the NFL the protection it seeks, but there is next to no chance of such a law before the league's owners vote on the Browns' move. Can't ignore us. We're going to win. There's no doubt in my mind that the majority of the owners will not sit still for this kind of duplicity. Implanting that thought in the minds of NFL owners is the mission of Save Our Browns. This is hardly a grassroots movement, having inherited the campaign organization for the tax referendum on the stadium repairs. This is a sophisticated operation. We are on the internet. With media strategies and a game plan. Let's do this literally in a military fashion plan our strategy, implement it. Uh, we don't want a rally. This is not a fraternity frolic. The goal of Save Our Browns, millions of signatures, letters, and faxes to sway NFL owners against the move. Quite literally, there are petitions everywhere in Greater Cleveland as the Save Our Browns organization tries to gather those signatures. Let's call in Chris Mortensen. Mort, what effect are those signatures and the emotions they represent, not just through this region, but throughout the country? What effect are they having on the league owners? Well, Bob, it, it's, been, it's been the catalyst. I mean, talk to Patrick Bowen of the Denver Broncos today, and he said it's had a real impact. You know, not only have we seen the public show of support, Bob, but we have seen faxes, four to five hundred sent to each and every owner, to the point where Bowen said he had to change around his fax line just so he can get his normal business done. He tells me to send the message to the Cleveland Browns fans. They get the message. And for the first time, Bob, I think it has really struck a moral nerve among the owners. They will vote on January 17th. There was a request from the House of Representatives to push it back. And Commissioner Tangley Lu said no. Votes coming January 17th. Are there enough no votes? Are there eight no votes to stop this? There is without question enough no votes to stop this move. There is one very important condition, Bob. The Cleveland package must be real. This must not be any phony uh, $175 million with a bunch of holes in it. They need to tighten this package up. If they have it tightened by January 17th, they get the no vote, even though there's an antitrust risk. You know, as Boland says, uh, Cleveland brings everything to a head. It's the straw that broke the camel's back, and the owners are having a real strong self-examination here, and they will block this move if, as I say, this package is real.
Mort, NFL president Neil Austrian told me today that this could be the issue, the Browns, on which the league will stop and make an antitrust fight in court and think they can win. Sketch out the scenarios now. As you say, there are enough no votes to stop it. What could happen? Well, there's a lot of them, Bob. Number one priority is keep this Browns team in Cleveland and convince Art Modell to sell the club to satisfy any personal debt or family security problems that he has. Now, there is a scenario, number two, in which Modell takes this particular roster of players, moves them to Baltimore, and leaves the Browns' name behind. That's been discussed. But the talk about the Buccaneers moving to Cleveland, I think it's an unlikely. I think the team you have to watch under this scenario with the Browns' nickname staying behind are the Cincinnati Bengals. They have a vote on a new stadium in March. Uh, Mike Brown, the general manager there, has been very low-key about this, but I think if that March vote gets turned down for a new stadium in Cincinnati, then I think the Bengals take a look at Cleveland, which would be, uh, would be uh, ironic because Paul Brown, Mike's father, of course, that's why they're called the Cleveland Browns. Last scenario, a two-team expansion, Bob, an expansion to L.A. and then to Cleveland and or Baltimore, and that's the least popular one, and I don't think that's going to happen. All of that's going to end up on the desk of Commissioner Paul Tagliabue-Mort. What is his role as he, yes, prepares the report for the owners on the 17th of January, but even beyond that? Well, Bob, it's been said that Paul Tagliabue's legacy is going to be dependent upon what happens with the Cleveland Browns. Number one, he's committed. He's going to take a stand, block Art Modell. Number two, he's got to come up with a very uh, good solution for Baltimore. Baltimore's legally bound right now to, uh, to the Cleveland Browns. And so what happens there? Well, at that meeting in Dallas, you will see the NFL owners vote to guarantee Baltimore a team. As Pat Bowen told me today, they'll tell Baltimore, build it and we will come, we'll get you a team by 1998. Now, which team? Well, there's been talk about the Buccaneers, the Bengals, that expansion scenario. But you know what, Bob? I had a team executive tell me uh, that this is being brainstormed about. Nothing more, nothing left, and it's highly speculative, but very dramatic, that the Colts, the Indianapolis Colts, could move back to Baltimore if they had their way under this scenario. Bob say the Indianapolis owner, is in very ill health right now. His son, Jimmy, is doing a lot of meeting with lawyers and doctors. They're not discussing a move to Baltimore right now, but this is simply league think at this point, two or three years down the line, Indianapolis does have a lease. I don't mean to cut, raise any alarms, ring the bells in Indianapolis. It's a brainstorm, but it's a long list of what ifs in this uh, very dramatic story, Bob. Bottom line, the league will stand and fight. Good chance of football next year of some sort here in Cleveland. Mort, we'll talk with you later. Thanks. When we continue, the epidemic of moving teams. It isn't new, and it isn't over. The Cardinals are talking about moving to Los Angeles to replace the Rams who moved to St. Louis to replace the Cardinals after they moved to Phoenix. Outside the Lines is brought to you by Courtyard by Marriott, the hotel designed by business travelers. A cold, damp, and foggy night at Municipal Stadium on the shores of Lake Erie, the cityscape of Cleveland, as they wonder if they will be able to keep their team. There weren't always the Browns in Cleveland. This city once was home to the NFL Rams, the same way Brooklyn once had the Dodgers. Now, there's no novelty to teams picking up and moving. The novelty now is the speed and the volume of those moves. But with players chasing dollars at the expense of stability, how surprising can it be that we are now in the era of franchise free agency? Here's Keith Olbermann. An era which actually began in 1882, when the Troy Haymakers of the National League, featuring four future Baseball Hall of Famers, moved to New York to become the Giants who then in the 50s moved to San Francisco, who then in the 70s threatened to move to Toronto, who then in the 80s threatened to move to San Jose, who then in the 90s threatened to move to St. Petersburg. Name a franchise, and it either is threatening or has threatened or both. It's so bad, even the politicians have begun to sit up and take notice. Various NFL commentators reported that the Buccaneers will end up in Cleveland with the Browns name, the Buccaneers will end up in Baltimore. The Browns will be sold. The Oilers transfer is not a done deal. The Seattle Seahawks and Arizona Cardinals are talking about relocating to Los Angeles. If that isn't ironic enough, the Cardinals are talking about moving to Los Angeles to replace the Rams who moved to St. Louis to replace the Cardinals after they moved to Phoenix. Senator Glenn must feel like he's back orbiting the Earth as an astronaut again. And speaking of Astros, their owner, Drayton McLean, has taken this concept to a new level. In a span of weeks, he threatened to move the team, let it leak out that they were on the verge of going to Washington, then said he would stay in Houston for a year, during which fans will be threatened every day. 
show up or we leave next winter. There is the master of the process, Al Davis. He's made money moving. He's made money agreeing to move but never moving. He's made money not moving. He's made money moving back where he started. Franchise free agency is actually so old that some teams are doing it for the second time. The New York Yankees threatened to leave if Yankee Stadium wasn't remodeled. 20 years later, they are threatening to leave if Yankee Stadium isn't remodeled. What it boils down to is this. There are 113 franchises in the four major pro sports. Eliminate all the expansion teams, from the Cowboys to the Mets. Eliminate all the teams that have already moved, from the Rams to the Yankees. Yes, the Yankees moved to New York and Baltimore. Eliminate all the teams that are going to move, the Browns, the Oilers. Eliminate all the teams that threaten to move, like the White Sox or the Devils, and as a result are getting a new stadium, have gotten a new stadium, or have gotten big public money to improve their old stadium or deal. We started with 113 teams, and who's left? Five. The Indiana Pacers, the Toronto Maple Leafs, and they did get a modest $10 million in improvements a few years back. The Chicago Cubs, the St. Louis Cardinals, who, by the way, are for sale. And the team whose fans are the only ones who have this system beat, the Green Bay Packers. Community-owned. If they move, the town has to move with them. Uh-oh. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. Maybe I shouldn't have given anybody any ideas. As brownout in Cleveland continues, the central figure in this national sports drama, what kind of a man is Art Modell? He's like a godfather type of guy that'll do anything for you, but he's the boss. If the Cubs left, if WGM took them and moved them somewhere else, it would be a terrible, terrible thing. But if they did leave, I'd probably take money out of the bank and spend money on red sunglasses so I never had to see Cub Blue in any form again. I would wear red glasses for the rest of my life. And he would, no doubt. Art Modell is the central figure in this story. His financial dealings precipitated his decision to move, which then created the crisis here in Cleveland and the debate across America. Modell is a self-described graduate of the School of Hard Knocks, and he has probably never been heart knocked any harder. A lot of the person I know that wants people to like him, and he's like a godfather type of guy that'll do anything for you, but he's the boss, and he wants you to look up and feel good about him. The most important thing to Art Modell is to be loved. Even before the current storm, this was a man sensitive to what others said about him whose eyes could fill with tears and unkind remarks. The only place Art Modell finds affection now is in Baltimore. Before he was Cleveland's leading figure of the past generation, Modell was a hustling advertising executive from New York. 35 years ago, he scraped to finance a heavily leveraged purchase of the Cleveland Browns. The Brooklyn native heard the charges of carpetbagger. The word dogged him for years and it hurt. Modell's answer was to throw himself into Cleveland society. Modell loves to socialize with industrial leaders, bankers, and celebrities. He was enthralled by the financial fast lane of borrowing, planning, and building. Despite investments in real estate, his fortune is in football. He is often described as impulsive and emotional, a seat-of-the-pants businessman. Modell recently admitted he didn't realize he had paid $21 million in player bonuses this year. I thought the figure was 18 million. It didn't make me happy when I heard it was 21. He learned the correct figure from a newspaper, which begs the question, did Art Modell put himself in what he says is a $60 million hole? Ten years ago, the Browns had very little debt, which means they've since fallen into that sea of red ink, even as Modell's annual NFL TV income more than quintupled to $36 million a year. When Cleveland began its downtown renaissance, Modell, the ultimate player in this city, waited for his turn. I didn't realize what was going on behind my back. He was stung, personally, as Jacobs Field, Gundarina, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, a half billion dollars of development went up while his stadium crumbled. Time and time again, we'll get through with this and your turn comes next. We will take care of the Browns. We will take care of the Browns over and over again. If the city had done a year ago, I think, with what they're trying to do now to keep him, this never would have happened. Instead, his business crisis fed his emotions, and now Art Modell is rejected by the very city establishment he once embodied. 
Even the Cleveland Clinic, for whom Modell helped raise $30 million, pulled its advertising from his stadium. This is really a big burden on a person, what he's going through. As I said, he's an emotional person. And if that's so, you can imagine what he's going through right now. There's a real world. It's capitalism at its best and at its worst. And that's what you see going on right now. And Art Modell just happened to be one of those who tapped into a nerve that is not going to die. What kind of a businessman is Art Modell? Outside the lines has learned Modell vastly overstated the size of his ownership stake to prospective members of Brown's management. Modell also has a history of early morning visits to the bank to cut competitors off at the pass. Last month, the morning of the Baltimore announcement, he paid off his Cleveland debts with money borrowed in Baltimore to prevent any Cleveland financial pressure. And 13 years ago, he avoided a court injunction with an early morning bank deal. That was a deal that erased Modell's personal debt while increasing the Browns' debt by 800%. The Ohio State Supreme Court later overturned that deal. Joining us once again, Chris Mortensen. Mort, they'll have a trial on February 12th on the merits of breaking the lease here at Municipal Stadium if the Browns are forced to play here under a court order next year. It's the lame duck scenario. Mm -hmm. There's been talk that there would just be a, a fire sale to cut costs here on this team. Well, already this year we've seen players get benched so they, so they wouldn't be paid their incentive bonus money because that rolls into next year's cap. And I think if they're forced to play in Cleveland next year, you'll see a real cash crunch and you'll see some players who are cut and or asked to take pay cuts. I mean, I'm looking at Vinny Testaverde, the quarterback. He's going to make $3.4 million uh, next year. And I think when you look at Eric Zire, who Modell loves, Zire makes only $280,000. I could see where they try to dump Vinny Testaverde. You know, he had to borrow $5 million just to get a signing bonus to Andre Risen. And some people say, well, risen has been a flop. He's been a troublemaker again. Why not cut him? Well, the problem with under the salary cap rules, he can't cut Andre Risen because he would take a bigger hit under the cap. So I think players like Pepper Johnson, Carl Banks, uh, Michael Jackson, a wide receiver, a lot of players on offense. They spend a lot of money on this offense, and it's only averaging about 17 points per game. So I think you will see a bit of a fire sale and a bare-bones operation as uh, you know the minimum requirements of the NFL if, in fact, the Browns stay in Cleveland next year with Art Modell as the owner. Team right now is 4-10. and 10. Bill Belichick has been given a public assurance he has a job next year if and when they move to Baltimore. Is that a valid assurance, do you think? I don't think so, uh, Bob. You know, th he's been in constant communication and contact on the phone with Belichick and Mike Lombardi, his personnel director. And while he's made this public assurance, he's hinted to Baltimore people, according to sources I've spoken with, that he will evaluate Belichick at the end of the year. And that, in fact, if he does move to Baltimore, he might just start anew, start fresh. And, uh, you know, the only guy I think who might survive that, from what I understand in terms of the, the name guys in that front office, might be Ozzie Newsom, his former great tight end. But that's speculative at this point. Okay, more thanks. As we continue from Municipal Stadium, we'll look at the city of Cleveland and what the Browns mean to the people who live here. A stadium full of memories and a city wondering whether football will continue to fill this house after Sunday. Cleveland Browns. The franchise is worth around $160 million right now. If and when they do move to Baltimore, that value would skyrocket with their sweetheart stadium deal, guaranteeing them all income down in Baltimore. As a business decision, Art Modell's move is a master stroke. But Frank DeFord considers the bottom line in this city written in flesh and blood. This just in, the Cleveland Symphony Orchestra has been sold to Memphis. Although in Memphis, it will continue to use the name Cleveland Symphony Orchestra. ESPN has learned exclusively that the Cleveland Zoo will be moving to Jacksonville just in time for the next mating season. Now, if any of that were true, we would all be dazed. Nowhere in this country can you simply pick up and move municipal institutions. Unless, of course, they are merely sports teams. Our city's team is not ours. It is owned. It is somebody's personal property. Somehow, though, for as long as this civic double cross has been going on, the theft of Cleveland's Browns seems to be the most egregiously unfair of all franchise betrayals. After all, the 
Cleveland fans have been so stalwart in the face of sustained mediocrity. Even after the apostate Modell declared for Baltimore, the Brown faithful kept showing up. There must be a touch of the masochistic in Cleveland. Why, the other day, there were baseball fans queuing up in the cold to buy tickets to cheer for Albert Bell? Already they've sold out 1996, the first time a baseball team ever had a 100% season pre-sale. But then after all the years of bad jokes from heartless comedians about the mistake on the lake, Cleveland is now thriving. The pennant-winning Indians, the mecca of rock and roll. And somehow it's even more tasteless to, to spoil a renaissance party, to kick an old city when it's finally up. But also it is simply Cleveland football. Cleveland and the Browns have always been the guts of professional football, the viscera of the NFL. Now, the effete East may have given us college boy football, but the manly pros started here in the Midwest, midst the steel and the coal and smoke and the fire. Well, the NFL was founded just down the road from Cleveland in Canton, where the Hall of Fame is now, and Cleveland was one of four Ohio teams that first NFL season, 1920. And even from their start in the old All-American Conference, the Browns were just so honest. Otto Graham wasn't flamboyant, simply successful. Marion Motley ran over people, and Lou Groza smashed them when he wasn't kicking. And then, of course, came the non pareil Jim Brown, the toughest ball carrier there ever was. And always there was Paul Brown, methodical and no-nonsense, the coach and namesake, born a Buckeye, a Buckeye all his life. The Browns, just that. They're the only team with a plain drab helmet and Significantly, when some sort of color did come to the team in the presence of the dog pound, that materialized in the end zone. The Browns have never been a chic, 50-yard line kind of team. No, they were their whole city's team. If the Indians or the Cavaliers or even the Democrats ever disappointed, Cleveland would turn its back on them for a while. However far the Browns might slip, the people never stopped coming out to this mausoleum of a stadium that takes the best that Lake Erie can throw in the face of anyone who buys a ticket for the privilege of enjoying frostbite. This grand old lakefront metropolis was founded almost exactly 200 years ago, 1796, by a man named Moses Cleveland. That's with an extra A. For convenience sake, to fit the name onto a newspaper masthead, the city lost a letter in 1832. Now for its bicentennial, it is losing something much more precious. Cleveland is losing the, the glue, the mucilage that every city needs to bind its many different hearts together. How can any one person own that and then take it away from any city? Next, what cities are spending to lure NFL teams? Nashville will get the Oilers, but is it worth it? I do not believe that seeing the Nashville skyline on Monday Night Football can overcome for what I consider to be a, a decision that ignores more basic city needs. Well, during all of the 1980s, American City spent $700 million building or reconstructing sports stadiums. Since 1992, just three years, that figure is now $1 billion. And if all the construction currently planned takes place, the cost may be $5 billion within five years. You want a team? Build a stadium, spend the money. Nashville is doing just that. They will get an NFL team. But at what price? Armin Katayan reports. It's a country song heard so often now in cities across the land. The lyrics of relocation sung on placards in the stands. To understand the loss in Texas, to a newfound love in Tennessee, forget about emotion and the future you will see. 
The biggest thing that I learned was to forget about all the hype on the sports pages. You know, your players will love living in Nashville. Um, the fans will love you here. I mean, ultimately, um, it is a business, and um, the owners are going to ultimately do like any business person does, which is try to figure out what's best for that business. As far as the ability to increase the cash flow, it'll be somewhere in the range of $20 million a year. The business of luring the Houston Oilers to Nashville in 1998 actually began three years ago. That's when this Harvard MBA, who had never attended a pro football game in his life, and the head of a local entertainment conglomerate, decided it was time for a booming city of 600,000 people to play in the big leagues. It'll help us economically. It'll help our image. Uh, it's something that lots of people want and enjoy, and uh, it's good for the city. It's the largest market in the United States that does not have a pro team. Uh, so it's a very attractive television market. The demographics are right uh, to bring the Major League Pro Sports team here. Uh, I think the best strategy for doing that is just to uh, walk up to the plate and take the bat off your shoulder and, and swing a couple times. Pitching the construction of a $120 million downtown arena, the capital of country music took its first swing and miss in 1993 at the Minnesota Timberwolves who used Nashville to cut a better deal at home. I don't think that was a foul off. That was a clean strike, that one. People say, well, you're just being used. Well, the fact is, uh, uh, if you don't step up to the plate, you're not going to get a hit. Nashville took another big swing last year and just missed landing the New Jersey Devils. The offer was pure business, featuring a one-third cut of all events held at the new arena, partly owned by Gaylord. Uh, what it really did was let everybody in the sports world know that we were dead serious about bringing professional sports to Nashville, Tennessee. I believe they'd be there today if, uh, if uh, they had not won the, the Stanley Cup. The Oilers have been a fixture in Houston for 36 years. But after three years of bickering over a new facility, the team turned its back on tradition and ultimately to a state with three TV markets in the top 65 a city that ranks third in the NFL in disposable income, and a mayor who was ready to do some business. At the end of the meeting, he told me, he said, uh, if, if you relocate to Nashville, we'll build you a stadium. Nashville's offer, a $292 million state-of-the-art stadium, backed by a sweetheart lease. In it, the Oilers get virtually all revenue from tickets, luxury suites, advertising, concessions, parking for 30 events a year. Estimated profit, at least $20 million per year, five times their current take from the Astrodome. I think a good stadium deal is, uh, is the magic bullet. But opponents of spending at least $115 million in public money to build a stadium on this site argue the city and state have far more pressing needs than professional football. That opposition was voiced at a recent Metro Council meeting before the council authorized spending $2 million in taxpayer money, promoting the sale of 120 luxury suites and $71 million worth of private seat licenses. I do not believe that seeing the Nashville skyline on Monday Night Football can overcome for what I consider to be a, a decision that ignores more basic city needs like fire and police, improving aging roads and overcrowded schools. Here at Belshire Middle School, half the students study outside in portables. There is one bathroom for 460 kids. The ceilings in some of the rooms leak when there's heavy rain. It was uh, the second six weeks of school before we had books for our children here. Get us off to a good start. You're on WTN. But the talk of the town these days is pro football. Now, in a perfect world, people rally around policemen, firemen, teachers, but we don't really live in a real world. They ra rally around Super Bowls and World Series, and, and that's what they rally around. It's sports. Having pro sports isn't the solution to, to all the problems of the world, but I think it moves us a step forward. A move inspired by the lyrics of relocation. If you build it, we will come. When Outside the Lines continues, how the many city seeking teams are financing their new stadiums. Done correctly, a permanent seat license plan is a very fair way to do it. I think this is I mean, clearly a product of say.
If the Cardinals move, I think it would be an even greater jolt for the city of St. Louis than the Browns moving is to Cleveland. Uh, the Browns have a long and glorious history, but basically it's from World War II on. The Cardinals' history is from the turn of the century on, and one of the most storied teams in baseball history. Uh, St. Louis would not be St. Louis without the Cardinals. And that team is for sale right now as we continue from Municipal Stadium in Cleveland. In the new parks, you really don't have obstructed seats or cramped seats, especially if you're paying a PSL, a permanent seat license. That's the price, often in thousands of dollars, that each and every fan pays for each seat, merely for the right to then spend more money to buy season tickets. But as Tony Bruno reports, PSLs are the new golden goose for pro sports owners. Preferred seat license, personal seat license, or permanent seat license. No matter what you call it, it still means the same thing. The price you pay for the right to buy a ticket. Charlotte has the highest maximum price, while the return of the NFL to St. Louis and Oakland costs between $250 and $4,500. The Nashville Oilers' plan will range from $500 to $4,000 a seat. The brainchild of sports marketing consultant Max Mullman. The PSL idea was really born out of uh, something we did with the Charlotte Hornets. Uh, the NBA had asked George Shin and the ownership group, uh, along with the other competitors, for an expansion franchise in the early 80s for the NBA to show season ticket indications. And uh, I suggested to Mr. Shin that we do something for the fans that I thought every fan would like, and that was to give them their control. They have the control of the season ticket rather than the club having the control. I mean, I think this is I mean, clearly a product of Satan. I mean, this, this whole setup is... It's, it's amazing when you think about it, the concept that, that in an entertainment industry um, that you would gouge, you know, your very strongest base of people. Then why PSLs? In St. Louis, 74 million of PSL money went to help pay the Rams' relocation expenses from Los Angeles. In Charlotte, Panther fans accounted for 150 of the $210 million needed for their new stadium. In Baltimore and Nashville, PSLs are big incentives in the stadium deals luring owners Art Modell and Bud Adams. The most misinterpreting about a PSL is that it's nothing but a surcharge. And in fact, uh, this is a way of financing stadiums that don't look like they're going to get built otherwise. And, and the burden is placed not on the taxpayer. It's strictly financial. I mean, what, what else can possibly come out of a personal seat license deal? Not fan loyalty, not interest in the game, uh, you know, certainly not sentiment or the feeling that sports headed in the right direction. The only thing that comes out of a personal seat license is dough. Incidentally, while PSLs may be new to pro sports, that concept has been around in college sports for decades where athletic donors have preferred access to purchase their tickets. Next, the Cleveland Browns, the Baltimore Browns. Which city has the edge? Nick Bakai with a comparison in his tale of the tape. <laughs> Laugh at the Browns move to Baltimore, you just might cry, and enough people have been doing that. So Nick Bakai turns his trained scientific eye on the merits of Cleveland versus Baltimore. The tale of the tape. Another NFL owner crushes the emotions of the fans. The Cleveland Browns become the Baltimore Browns. But hey, chin up, Cleveland. I hear the commission is working on getting you the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. But say, that's sort of like getting Vinny Testaverde to replace Bernie Kosar. Baltimore, after watching Robert Ursay pack up the trucks at midnight, how could you do it? But with that kind of karma, in the next life, you'll be the city Bill Bidwell moves his cards to. Here we go, the Cleveland Browns versus the Baltimore Browns. Hurts to say it. Let's see how they stack up at the tail of the tape. Greatest running back in franchise history, Cleveland Browns, Jim Brown. Baltimore Browns, um, Leroy Hort. Advantage the Cleveland Browns. Amazing local attractions, Cleveland, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Baltimore, Boog Powell's Cholesterol. Advantage the Cleveland Browns. Stadium names, Cleveland Browns, Cleveland Stadium. Baltimore Browns, the Temple of Greed at Camden Yards. Advantage, the Cleveland Browns. Stadium food favorites, Cleveland Browns, Polish Sausage. Baltimore Browns, 
Polish shrimp. That is push. Movies, Baltimore. Now the quiz in Diner has to be about Browns trivia. Cleveland still has Major League and Major League Two. <laughs> and that is push. What Santa has in his bag for you? Cleveland, lump of coal. Baltimore, Art Modell. Advantage, Cleveland. Fanatics, Cleveland Browns, the dog pound. Baltimore Browns, the crab cage. You see, all, all the fans have pincers instead of hands, and whenever Baltimore scores, they, they clack them together. Advantage, the Cleveland Browns. And finally, ownership. Cleveland Browns, Art Modell. Baltimore Browns, Art Modell. Advantage, push. There are no winners here. But there you have it. It's so simple when you break things down scientifically. In a moral victory, the advantage goes to the Cleveland Browns. As for Art Modell, a simple thought. You aren't rich enough to own a team. Sell it to someone who is. Look, we all get in over our heads. I mean, I owe MasterCard some serious dough. But you don't see me owning the Seahawks. The good people of Cleveland deserve this team a lot more than your offspring. Until next time, I'm Nick Bakai reminding you the numbers never lie. Outside the Lines is brought to you by Rayovac Renewal. Reusable alkaline power. Play it smart. There are some things in life you do simply because they're the right thing. Those are the words that Bob Grease used to describe his decision to sell his 43% piece of the Browns if the club moves from Cleveland. The right thing to do. That phrase is a backdrop for the next several months for the National Football League, for this city, and for Art Modell. If you can strip away the lawyers and the balance sheets and the posturing and remember why memories fill a place like this and how they matter far beyond Cleveland, now more than ever. For a transcript of this edition of Outside the Lines, please send $5 to Rooney Reporters, P.O. Box 9505, Fountain Valley, California, 92728.